Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. Last episode, we had just docked this large supply barge with Asteroid Yoy to fuel up our lander. And I'm just using ScanSat. I have a number of anomaly contracts, places to visit, one of which is this moon arc right here, moon arc number two. But I think what I really want is there's this crash site. We're coming up to that in just a couple of hours. So I think that will be our first target. So we'll make sure that the lander, of course, is fully stocked up now that we have ample supplies. But we did bring up a couple of other things, one of which is this gamma ray spectrometer from the KSP Interstellar Extended mod. So we'll stick that to the side of the Korion 3, our transfer vehicle, which got these folks to the moon in the first place. So we'll just fly Bartner on down here. Could always use more science equipment. All right, let's just stick it over here on the command capsule. Okay, we'll take a look a little bit later at what we can do with that. We also brought up a, another radiator. Uh, this is the to replace the one that McNan inadvertently broke uh, in episode 106 when he lost the grip on the ladder. Yeah. So Bartner's just going to have to shuffle this over. I should have thought ahead and brought over one of those... Um, Oh, uh, Kerbal Inventory System Containers. That's what I was trying to get at. Those in, in containers that you can put on the Kerbal's backs and put more stuff in them. But unfortunately, this is too big to fit into Bartner's inventory. So he's just going to have to, uh, well, kind of shuffle it over there. But, you know, didn't take too long till we got it back into place. There we go. Okay, let's extend that. Oh, yes. Good as new. Great work, partner. Your job is done for now, so we'll get him back inside. We'll see what we can do with this new gamma ray spectrometer. All right, let's check it out. Uh, let's see. Scan gamma rays. 54 science. Okay, half of which I can transmit. So might as well do that. I'm noticing it's just saying near space to the moon without there being a biome. So uh, for now, this is all we're going to be able to do with this. Okay, transmitting done. We'll grab the rest of that. We'll get Bartner to stow that away in a little bit. But let's uh, get out X science and see actually what can I do with this. So we'll do a search for gamma. Oh, take a look at these. All they say is near space. No space high, no surface, no nothing else. So that's the only biome I think that it can do. Uh, those are all biomes or spheres of influence that I've visited before. I can bring up all of them here. But yeah, they all say nothing but near space. So that's it. This thing can only do near space science. And uh, that's because it actually has a bit of a dual purpose. It's also a uh, scanner that you're meant to put on a satellite and scan the surface of the body that you're orbiting for radioactive isotopes like uranium and that's to be able so that you can harvest them and use that to feed your nuclear reactors this is all connected to the ksp interstellar extended mod so that's why not too much science with it in fact what i think i might do is take it off of the Korion and just stick it on to this uh i don't know can i call this a station yet i'm not sure i can but I'll stick it on here somewhere, and then this will be an orbiting, scanning, radioactive isotope finder, I guess. But anyway, there's nothing left to do but to time warp over our landing site. And then get ready to get ourselves down there. Ah! Let's get out of here. Okay, RCS. Push, push, push. Oh, hang on. Oh, shoot, I'm still on the rock. Uh, yeah, okay, just turned off the camera focus changer. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay, okay. Uh, well, this thing seems to be alright. I'll deal with it later. 
Um, well, I guess that worked that way too. <laughs> so uh, let's get this thing ready for the descent. And we'll just cut ahead in this thing. And also run this at four times speed because you've seen this kind of stuff before. Unfortunately, I am uh, coming in on the night side of the moon. So I've turned up the ambient, minimum ambient light a little bit. So hopefully you can still see some things, okay? But otherwise, well, I did overshoot again. <laughs> yeah, I really should just get in the habit of just coming in more steeply and not be so obsessed about coming in efficiently because this thing has quite a lot of fuel. Efficiency isn't a big deal. But as you can see, we got ourselves down to the surface without really much in the way of incident. And we're about 1,700 meters off from our target. And we are in the highlands, where I have been before relatively recently, including deploying all of the surface science pack stuff. So there really isn't much science to get. Well, hang on. I do have a notification up here. Let's check this out. Oh, come on. Get rid of that. There we go. Oh, it's a milestone. We have discovered a vessel of unknown origin on the moon. Well, not really yet, I guess. I guess Stock thinks we have, but I don't think we have. We still have a contract to fulfill, and that requires getting Val out there to do the, well, relatively short EVA with her EVA pack. Almost called it a jet pack. I think we have a tendency to want to call them jet packs. But of course, they're not jet packs because jets don't work in a vacuum. But you know, I, actually, before we head out, we should be dropping a flag down here. Besides commemorating the occasion, putting down a flag does get your Kerbal an extra little bit of experience. So we'll make sure to get Bartner and McNand out here a little bit later to do the same. Okay, so Kegel 4. What are we going to write here? Well, we should put their names. Val, Bartner, and McNand. Now to check out this crashed vessel. There we go. Okay, now let's get ourselves ready here. There is an spare monopropellant canister. Yeah, Valentina doesn't have it, so it must be inside here. Somebody has a spare. There it is. Give that to Valentina. Okay, just in case she needs it. Don't want to end up with her stranded without any propellant for her pack. And we are off. And of course, it was just a short EVA. I didn't even come close to having to need that extra canister there. Oh, well, that was weird. I just tried to turn on her lights and they didn't work. Let's try up here. Nope, they're not doing anything. Can you turn on her lights through the context menu? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, press L again. Okay, now it works. I don't, okay, whatever, they're on now. Okay, let's approach this here strange vessel. Oops, we can see a little bit under the ground there a little bit. Oh, no, 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 that spoils the illusion. We don't want that. Okay, we should be getting a message pretty soon here. I mean, we are right up beside it. Come on. Oh, there it is. It's, oh, Werner. You should really have a doctor look at that. That is not a healthy sound. Anyways, Werner says it's identical to the one on Kerbin. Perhaps it belonged to the monolith builders. Or perhaps the developers just didn't want to make another model. Oh, oh, no, no, sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to spoil the illusion there. And after brief and uneventful bit of exploration around this strange shaped object in the dark, so I guess there's no real point of showing it to you anymore, we got Val back to our lander. We collected what little science we could. We also made sure to get McNand and Bartner down to plant some flags as well. And then it was time to head on back 
and rendezvous again with Asteroid Yoy to do a refuel and to get ourselves taking a look at landing somewhere else. Okay, so we'll use the docking alignment indicator here to line up the docking ports. And it is drifting rather badly. This is pretty, pretty annoying. Uh, and the reason why that is happening is because the asteroid, not surprisingly, is tumbling. Oh, let's see if we can get over there and use the remote tech flight computer. Okay, let's just kill rotation. Unfortunately, putting on that kill rotation activates the reaction wheels. And that got that wonderful wobble happening. That I really should have gone back and tried to fix and tried to figure out what reaction wheels were fighting with one another. But, uh, well, I got a little bit stubborn about it and <laughs> decided I was going to try and dock anyway. What's really frustrating, too, is I've been trying to upgrade to 1.2.2. That's part of the reason why this video is a little bit later than what uh, the span between this video and the last video. It's a little bit longer than what it normally is because uh, I've been battling with that. And I actually got it to the point where I thought it was working. And I did this mission, this docking of 1.2. I got a landing coming up that's be coming up right after this where I go towards uh, land at my moon buggy and we're gonna take the moon buggy out for a scroll. I did that in 1.2 so I did quite a bit of lay, uh, playing around in 1.2 and then I went to the space plane hangar and tried to do some simulations and uh, Kerbal Construction Time didn't like the simulation mode in 1.2.2 uh, so I gotta get back and figure that out but what that made me do is go back to 1.1.3 which I left unmodified and uh, had to do this all over again. But you can see here, yeah, we got a lot of wobbling, a lot of bouncing off the asteroid happening, and my stubbornness wouldn't let it go. And finally though, well, I did get it in there. There it is, all right. So then began the process of refueling, which took a long time, and time warping doesn't make it go faster. Something that I discovered just when I was doing my 1.2 play of this is fixed in 1.2, but here I'm kind of stuck and waiting. And while I was waiting, I actually did some calculating, looked at the fuel that was left on my barge and how much fuel is we, uh, that the Kegel 4 holds, and realize that after filling this up, I actually could fill this up two more times, so I can do three more landings, that's fantastic. I also took a look at MapSat. If you take a look at this, actually, there are 12 squares across on the, on the map, big map grid here, and the moon takes about six days to rotate, so if you divide six days by 12, uh, and they're Kerbin days, of course, that are six hours long, uh, each of those squares is about three hours of rotation. So I can see here that I'm about three hours away from my next landing. Now you'll notice here that uh, the ship, the whole asteroid and ships aren't oscillating anymore. But that's simply because I turned the SAS and all the other flight assists off. So I'm just letting it tumble. But you know, maybe it's time to take a crack at actually stabilizing this thing. So we'll stop the time warping for now. I previously went around and turned off all of the reaction wheels. So I'm just going to turn on one set, the ones that are in the Lima capsule there, because they're the ones that are closest. We'll put on the SAS and we will set our rotation to be relative to the sun using the persistent rotation mod. Okay, it seems to be settling in. And I don't see any sense of wobbling. Let's increase our time warping. Oh, oh, this looks pretty stable. Oh, I think I finally have this licked. Hallelujah. All right. Well, it was a simple matter now to just time warp till we were ready to do our next descent. And if I seem a smidge aggressive in my approach, a smidge too familiar. Well, remember, this is actually the second time I've done this landing because I did it in 1.2 and then had to come back. Nothing like a little bit of practice. Oh, a little bit of a bounce there at the end, but that's okay. And we'll give Bartner 
the job of putting down the official flag here. So, Kegel 4, Bartner, Val, and McNand. Well, again, I want to go for a drive. Yes, Bartner, we all want to go for a drive. We all want to test out our moon buggy. So let's pile our entire crew in here and head off to that arch. Now, although the Kegel 4 is loaded with that surface science pack stuff, I didn't bother using any of it because this boom buggy also has the full complement of surface science pack equipment. And I know by the time I get to that arch that uh, I'm still going to be in the Midlands, so I might as well just unpack it once and set it up once because it is a bit of a pain to set up. Take a look at the inside view here. Oh, this is nice. Oh, we got Kerbin way up there. See, it looks like we just missed an eclipse. Which is a good thing because this thing is primarily solar powered. I do have a fuel cell aboard and a little bit of LFO, but that's really for emergency purposes. Oh, we are closing in on that arch now. It wasn't very far away, of course. But I think I'm going to need to do an EVA to fill, fulfill the requirements of the contract. So we'll put on the brakes. Get our speed down to zero. There we go. Okay, get out of interior view. And oh, wait, got to put the brakes back on again. <laughs> there we go. EVA Valentina. And our message is from Gene. That's quite an arch. Do you think we could move the moon if we had a really big hook? No. The moon is on rails, you silly doofus. Don't you know Kerbal physics? My goodness. Anyway, it's time to set up our science equipment pack, and that's why we got Bartner along here. And we'll do this again four times speed because, oh my goodness, this takes a long time to set this all up. But that's why I put this little deck here. Um... So that I can set it up on the deck and then I won't have to take it apart again and we can drive it around just the way it is set up right here. And then once Bartner got his job done, it was time to collect the science that McNan could do from the comfort of his seat inside. And this surface science stuff, I mean, it, it, you know, it, what, there's a couple of great things about it. Number one is you can transmit all of it. That's always great. And it's not insignificant either. I mean, a number of these experiments are 72 science each. That's pretty significant. And the two big solar arrays we got attached provides more than enough electricity. Once we got that all done, of course, it was time to get everybody back inside and to head off once again to our next destination. I'm going to keep the speed of the playback at four times speed so I can show you this whole journey. Number one, because really wasn't that far. I'm really not getting that far away from where the arch is. You'll be able to see it a number of times during this journey. But number two, just to show you the performance of this little vehicle, I have to say I'm pretty happy with it. I ended up putting two wheels at the back, as you can see, for a total of six. And that really does help with the traction on the steeper hills. Um, I, that turned out to be a pretty good decision right there. Anyway, if we take a look at the uh, mini-map on ScanSat, you can see that there are two biomes there that I can still get to. This is part of the reason why I picked this location, because there were two nearby biomes. Uh, a little bit, uh, I guess that's north by northeast. There is a brown patch there. Those are Midland Craters. And then the big dark green area to the east of us, or to the west of us, I'm sorry, is the northwest crater. So we'll be visiting both of those. Yeah, we're heading back down now into this second crater here. I'm a little more cautious probably than most with my rovers. I'm always paranoid, especially in the lower gravity of the moon, of doing a roll. I can't uh, retract those big solar panels. That uh, might not have been the best of design decisions right there. So if I do roll it, I'm likely to smash those up. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that I will smash those up. So I'm being a little bit cautious here. Ooh, we'll go to the interior view, though, for a little while. Coming up to the lip of this crow. Oh, that was a little spooky. 
Okay, and now we are coming down and oh, we just got into the Midland Craters here. Still, uh, let's get down to that flatter area down below before we start collecting us some science though, before we put this into park. Okay, things seem to be leveling off now. Yes, it is science time. And of course, you know how this is all going to work. It's exactly a rinse and repeat of what we did up in the Midlands. And we planted another flag to mark our location here. And then we started heading west to the northwest crater and started rinsing and repeating and doing the same thing. And in fact, you can see right here, uh, I can still see the arch <laughs> out here from the northwest crater. So you can tell that this whole journey, not just kind of just in around the same sort of area. And of course, once this was collected, it was time to head back home. Not home, really, of course, back to the Kegel 4, which will eventually take us up to Asteroid Yoy, which will eventually get us into the Karayan 3, which hopefully will get us to Kerbin Station. <laughs> and then somebody will pick us up and take us home. It's, uh, there's a few legs to this particular journey. You know, one of the assets for the moon that I do have being built in the VAB right now is a Mooner Harvester that I was going to use in conjunction with the Kegel 4 so that you could f fill up the Kegel 4 on the surface and hop around between different biomes doing suborbital hops. But I don't know, I really like this rover and I gotta think about this a little bit more. But right now, oh, we're gonna park it in here. Come around the side. I wanna get in nice and close because I want to do some resource sharing here. There we are. <laughs> If you get in a little bit closer here. Because, uh, of course, we're going to get uh, McNan to transfer over all the science that we collected. Actually, it's not a huge amount that we collected. The vast majority of it we transmitted. So we've got to get ourselves to the KSCs to see how much science we actually have. And then Bartner, he's going to do a little bit of resource transferring. I really don't see myself coming back here to reuse this rover. If I want to keep using rovers, I'm going to have to probably drop other ones in other places. But that's going to have to be for the future to be considered. And with that all done, we made sure Bartner turned off the lights in the rover, got himself into the lander, then it was time to take off. And I was gonna move the rover a little bit further away from the lander, but uh, Wotek kept telling me I didn't have a connection, even though it sort of was telling me I did have a connection because the connection is green. I couldn't figure that out, so, well, the hell with it. I mean, I could have moved a Kerbal over there and moved it, but I think I can get away without clipping that solar panel, hopefully. Well, let's give her a go. Ooh, that was kind of close. <laughs> anyway, we are off heading our way back to Asteroid Yoy. One of the nice things about the moon rotating so slowly is though, even though we're on the surface for more than an hour and a half, we actually aren't too far away. We haven't drifted too far to the east of the asteroid's orbit. So setting up the rendezvous wasn't much of a problem. And thankfully, neither was the docking. Now that I have this stabilization issue straightened out with the asteroid, oh my gosh, what a nice, easy, dreamy thing this was, docking with the asteroid. And with that done, it was time, of course, to start refueling once again. And during the process of refueling, I took a look at MapSat and noticed that it was going to be at least a couple more days before we were over another one of our landing spots. And as mentioned, I do have a couple more assets being built in the VAB that are going to be on their way soon. One being that Mooner Harvester that I mentioned earlier, but another one, well, I'm going to leave it as a surprise. You're going to see it pretty early in the next episode, but uh, it should make these folks a little bit more comfortable. And also, McNand and Val are both ready to level up, so maybe I should get them down to the surface so that can be accomplished. And besides, these folks have actually been in space for a long time. I haven't counted out the days, but 
you might recall that they initially did a flyby of the moon, got an orbit around Minmus, went to Minmus Station, then flew back to the moon, have been doing all this kind of stuff in and around the moon, including mucking around with failed harvesting attempts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you, maybe they've been out long enough. I think it might be time to get them back. So we will put them all back into the Korion 3. We will send the Korion 3 on its way. Uh, unfortunately, because of the alignment of this polar orbit and the moon's orbit around Kerbin and all of that kind of thing, it's going to be about another day before we are ready to perform that burn. So in the meantime, why don't we get ourselves back to the Kerbal Space Center and see what the result is of all that science that we transmitted. Woo! 2069 science! Awesome! Let's get ourselves into research and development and see what we can get. And immediately I went for Ion Propulsion. Just grab that one right away. It's a little bit overdue, in fact. I have another Moho window coming up, so I wouldn't mind sending something out that way, taking advantage of that window. And now I got, well... Yeah, I, uh, I got less than 1,500, so I'd, I'd best get one of these ones for 1,000, I think. I don't think there's anything here for 500 that's too much of a big deal. Nope. So I ummed and odd. There are actually quite a number of interesting choices. But I ended up going for high-efficiency nuclear propulsion for the KSP Interstellar Extended Closed Cycle Gas Core Engine the nuclear turbojet engine, and a collection of high-efficiency thermal rocket nozzles. This should allow me to build some pretty cool ways to get my Kerbals where they need to go. But you know that's going to have to be for future episodes. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.